Great. Uh, good morning. Excellent. Most everybody's awake. That's good. Um, I do promise this will be the shortest class of the term, unless you really knew the answers to a test, in which case you got in and out of here quickly. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's always fun to come and talk to um, folks in, a, in an accounting program or in a business program, and the reason is because I wanted to get into education as a, uh, as a college student. In fact, a student taught sixth grade in, when I was a junior in college and then decided after that that it wasn't quite going to be for me, and I took my one and only accounting class my senior fall. And that's um, when I started to get into the accounting world. So it's, it's fun to do this. This is supposed to be an interactive class. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to raise your hand and, um, and ask me a question. And it's also, there are a number of questions that we've got in the presentation, um, none of which deal with accounting, um, but more sociology. So those of you who are also taking sociology classes, I'm sure will jump right in and help us answer these questions. Um, now. In order to move the slide forward, oh, okay, all right, so here's what we're going to do, right? We're going to, I'm asking you to pay attention because this is information that will all help you, I think, in your choice of careers and in where you want to go moving forward, all right? We're going to talk a little bit about the accounting industry generally. I was, the professor asked me to lecture on a number of different accounting principle issues. We talked about revenue recognition. We talked about fixed assets. Um, we talked about one other topic. And after going through all the different accounting topics to talk about, I decided that wouldn't be a good idea. So what it would be a lot more useful for you folks to uh, hear from me about is something about how the accounting profession works. This is something that I really didn't understand very well when I was an undergraduate and, frankly, a little bit even when I was a graduate student. So that's why I got, got, came up with this idea to chat with you a little bit today about how the accounting profession works so that you have an understanding on how it might work in your career, okay? Um, we're going to talk about public accounting. We'll also talk a little bit about private accounting. And then I promise, for those of you still around at the end, um, there will be a little payoff, and I'll give you some wisdom um, to walk out of here with. Um, why am I someone who you should listen to? There's a little bit of my resume. Uh, I went to Dartmouth as an undergrad. I uh, majored in government and economics. I took one accounting class at um, Dartmouth, but then I went to Northeastern in uh, 19, 1979, the day after I graduated from college, actually, and uh, got my master's in accounting and then went back and finished off my MBA a little while later. I started work with Pricewaterhouse, and we'll talk about the public accounting firms later on. The public Pricewaterhouse is best known for what? They're an accounting firm, but why, why do you know them as an accounting firm? Big four. They are final. I call them the final four. So you guys understand that. Any other, any other, anybody else know why Pricewaterhouse is famous? Anybody stay up two Sunday nights ago watching anything on television? No, huh? No movie fanatics here. Back in the day before um, advertising got very expensive, they actually would let the accounting partners walk out on the stage at the Academy Awards and present the suitcases that had all the award certificates in it, right? But that was where Price Waterhouse got probably its most notoriety. Is it is, in the early Academy Awards, you'll see the two partners now walking on the red carpet, bringing in the two suitcases handcuffed to their hands with the, uh, with the awards. And the, I went to work for a company called Westinghouse Broadcasting and Cable. Anybody heard of Westinghouse? Couple people. Westinghouse was actually one of the big manufacturing companies of uh, last century. It got run out of town by another company called General Electric. Okay, Westinghouse made a lot of light bulbs. That was actually one of the reasons they were famous. They also had a lot of appliances, and they were they're actually they're still around because all the nuclear power plants that they built in the U.S. are still operational. So um, that's where you might run into the name Westinghouse every once in a while. They got into the media business in the middle of last century, and uh, I got in the cable television part of that in 1983, became a CFO, an OFO. OFO, anybody heard of that term before? Only financial officer. <laughs> okay, I was an OFO at TKR Cable Company, which was a little cable company that was in um, mostly around Route 287 
in New Jersey. Must have some people from Edison, New Brunswick, um, right that area. TKR Cable was there up until 1998 when we sold the company to uh, Cablevision. Uh, I then worked as the chief operating officer for TCI um, during two years, 98 and 99. Uh, and then I heard the internet was going to be big and I started getting involved with a number of internet companies that were in the media slash advertising space. And um, I really helped turn them around. A number, a couple private companies at the beginning, one that we almost took public, Bigfoot Interactive, which has an email forwarding system, and then a number of advertising firms as well as um, Audible, where I do work now up on 15, 16, and 17. Audible. Who's heard of Audible before besides being on? What, what do we do? Who knows what we do? Really? I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Okay, you know, what, do we, what do we do? We sell audio books online. Right, right. We are the leading provider of digitally downloaded audio books. Uh, we have over 100,000 different titles. We've got 55,000 different unabridged audio books in English on our websites. We also run websites in the UK. France and Germany. Uh, I help run, I help the guys who, uh, the men and women who run those websites, and then I also am the financial officer here in the U.S. Our offices are totally open. We have no, no offices with sofas in them anymore. I used to have that back in the cable business. When I was back here at little TKR cable company, I had this nice corner office, sofa, TV, stereo. It was great. Um, no, now we're, uh, we're in a world where we have a completely open space, um, and it's, a, you know, it's an interesting environment to work on, but it's nice for everybody because uh, we have you know, totally unobstructed views on the 15, 16, 17, overlooking you know, everything from Manhattan to the ridge up there where Montclair is, and it's really, it's really it's very nice views of Newark and New York City and all the surrounding territory. But it's also a good way to be able to talk to people very quickly because um, uh, as people on my team know, I have the capability to project. So I will frequently just stand up and say, hey, Eric, how many highest customers do we have in June? And you know, from 30 feet away, he'll be able to respond. <laughs> and, and a lot of people will know. Um, I've been on the board of directors of a number of different accounting or finance industry organizations. And one of the things that you'll do as you move on in your career, one of the things I would encourage you to do is get involved in industry organizations. Right? When you work for a company, you know, try to find out what industry organizations are in that area. For instance, there's the, the Internet Advertising Group of New York. All right? There are sales organizations, there are marketing organizations, there are creative organizations. Whatever, whatever discipline you end up in, Work hard with your supervisor to take time out to understand the industry organizations. It's a great way to network with other people that are in your business and meet other people and find out best practices, right, for how you do different things. So I've been in that, in that kind of an organization in the cable TV world, in the broadcast world, and in the Internet world. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, good question. Great question. Um, I'm not sure how it happened, but when I was in graduate school, uh, in Northeastern's graduate school program had a had its summer during the winter. All right. Any idea why an accounting graduate program would have its summer during the winter? Who can help me? Yes. It's a very busy season, in part because of taxes. No, no question. It's not, not the print. The, the busiest tax season, believe it or not, is actually the summer. All right? Now, it, because, because most everybody who files taxes gets extensions into September and has to finalize their term. Most corporate returns are due then. But you're, you're, you're extremely warm. You're caliente. <laughs> yeah, it's the end of the business year, right? And so there's a lot of audit work that gets done at the end of the year. And the, so the winter time tends to be a very busy time for accounting firms because the public companies have 12, 31 year ends, calendar year year ends. Other companies do have different year ends. Like I think Apple's year ends 330. 
331 rather. And you know, there are there are different year ends that help stagger busy times, but that's one of those. I got assigned to IBM when I was an intern. And uh, I was on IBM at the corporate headquarters in Armagh. The why that was kind of interesting or coincidental, my father worked for I've been moved for many years during the 60s and early 70s. We moved around a lot. I lived in New Jersey during the um, uh, Eisenhower and Kennedy administrations. Uh, and and uh, when, I was, when I came back to Pricewaterhouse after that, I was assigned to IBM. And then I also got assigned to Young and Rubicam, which was an advertising firm. But it was very messy. They figured out when I was dealing with IBM that I didn't like something that was very clean. And IBM was very clean. Most everything was correct at IBM. And I wasn't very good dealing with things that were correct. I found out early on in my career I was not good at dealing things that were correct. I'd like to help fix things. Okay? And it's important to know, you know, and it's important to understand that about yourself, too, going up. Because... You know, if you saw my desk area, you'd say, yeah, I can see you like to fix things. Although you might want to start with your desk because um, it's not very clean. Um, but everything is neatly, you know, I have neat piles of everything, and I like to fix things. And I found out that Young and Rubicam was an advertising agency that needed fixing. And so I got involved very deeply with Young and Rubicam, really enjoyed it, actually found a couple things that were very, very wrong, which was problematic. And so then when <clears throat> Westinghouse acquired Teleprompter, which was a cable television company, in 1980, I got pulled from IBM to go work on the Westinghouse cable. Uh, Westinghouse was audited by Pricewaterhouse in Pittsburgh. It's the way, this is the way things work in the real world. Um, uh, Teleprompter had been audited by Ernst & Winnie at the time, now Ernst & Young. And uh, Ernst and Winnie lost the audit because the corporate parent, Price Waterhouse, was auditing Westinghouse, and so the Price Waterhouse guys came in and started to audit the uh, cable television deal, and that was really screwed up. So I had a great time working on that particular assignment, and after a year and a half of working on that, almost year, not year round, because I, I also worked on Young and Rubicam. The client made me an offer I couldn't refuse to go work with him. So that's how I went from uh, Price Waterhouse on to uh, Group W Cable. All right. Um, the other thing was, I, and I, I, I don't like to dwell on this, I was uh, selected to the, the New Jersey Technology Council's Hall of Fame last year as a CFO. Um, I will tell you that I, for years I made jokes about both my own work and the work of some of the folks on my staff and said, this spreadsheet will never get you to the Accounting Hall of Fame. And uh, when a senior had told that of me, so Mitchell, this spreadsheet's never going to get you to the Accounting Hall of Fame, only to, you know, it was a, just a figure of speech at the time, only to find out that there was actually a Hall of Fame you could get to. Right? <laughs> so, um, anybody else have a question about, you know, my career? Because I, I definitely want to let you out early. <laughs> um, okay. I I think I've gone too far. It is very true. Hmm. Okay, great. So here's the competition. There are 225,000 students domestically, U.S., enrolled in undergraduate accounting classes right now. I guess that includes master's and Ph.D. Um, programs. We're not talking about the Ph.D. job business today. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but certainly teaching and accounting is something that is uh, another career choice that other people, that someone else can probably comment on much more gracefully than I can. There's been a 30% growth in master's programs since 2009. For those of you who know the answer for that, hold your tongues because you will get a chance to answer that reason. Um, shortly. We've had just about a 4% increase uh, in undergraduate BA programs and accounting concentration is 86% of master's degrees. Great. Okay. So this is a uh, graph that I got out of information produced by the AICPA and uh, I just triggered 
every five years I triggered um, numbers, so it's not completely plagiarized from their um, document. Uh, I have two questions. Why do you think there was an increase in the in the in the number of college students enrolled in accounting classes during the 70s? I don't have the answer to this. You know, this is not a something I've got an answer to, but this is something that you know I think we can probably weigh in on. Why do you think? One of the things that uh, businesses certainly all began to get larger in the 70s, okay? And even even the manufacturing companies began to buy one another, okay? So um, businesses became larger, became more global, and computer use became more prevalent, right, during the 70s. So things did get more complicated to use, and I think that that's one of the reasons why accounting accountants got involved in it, right? Why else? Any other ideas on why there might have been an increase here in the 70s in the number of people taking accounting? Well, there, there was a loss of blue-collar jobs. Very great answer. I hadn't even thought of that one, right? As America began to get more service-oriented, right, one of the things that America did have was good intellectual, good, a good education system that could, in fact, lead to an increase in the number of students who, you know, were taking accounting as a course, yeah? Right. It, became, it was a lot harder for people to um, get to the corner office, to a CEO's office, by just going to uh, Professor Any Fool Knows class, right, at, at uh, you know, at the local high school. Right, they actually, you know, needed to have degrees. So it was probably a similar. You probably probably would see a similar increase in the number of college graduates, okay, during this period. Any reason for that? I'm impressed somebody actually knows about the Vietnam War. Um, now, now I, I will say that that many people actually went to college to avoid going to the Vietnam War. Okay, during the 60s, you know, kind of a rugged time in American history. Um, but there's certainly an element of that, right? And people, there's a, there's a, there was a much bigger increase in um, job growth and education in the, in the late 40s, early 50s because of the wars and people coming back from the wars. But that leads to, but that actually leads to a problem here. Why else? It was a big problem with inflation in the late 70s, although, which, 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 made, which is one of the things that made accounting more complicated at the time. Actually, there was FAS 33 that was uh, price level accounting that was big during that period of time. And it, um, you know, I was an expert in, in the supplemental financial statements for price level accounting at that period of time. Now, nobody knows what inflation is. But, um, but that had, it certainly, the profession became more accounting. The other thing I think I wanted to point out was that you know, there was also an increase in the number of kids at the time, right? Baby boomers are coming up, right? I'm class of 79 in college, and I'm right at the tail end of the baby boom. So, you know, we did see an increase in um, kids coming through who were graduating from college. And moving on, we did see this dip here. See a little bit of a dip in the late 80s, and then a big dip here going into 2001. Any ideas on what might have happened there? Yes? Yeah, that was my read on this too. Is that this is this this coincides with, you know, the, the the real expansion of the internet, okay, and real expansion of internet businesses, which led to a lot of people starting being able to start their own businesses. Yeah. Right. It was easier to get into different jobs. You didn't have to necessarily be as trained, okay? There's a little bit of recession impact here, right? In both these periods, this is post-stock market crash of 88. This is post-stock market crash of 2000, 2001, right? So there's a little bit of that happening there as well, okay? What's behind this? Look at the number of master students doubling. What's behind that? Yeah. A little bit of it's Sarbanes-Oxley. 
Yeah, no doubt, which is 2000 time frame. That's actually what got me into public accounting as much as anything, because every single one of those companies I've been in charge of as, uh, it, it, at, at Max Worldwide, I succeeded a CFO who had gone to jail. <laughs> and then at Viewpoint, um, I succeeded a, you know, a CFO who had, and both Viewpoint and Audible had a lot of internal control weaknesses. So that's why I got involved, yeah? Some of that, yeah, some of that, international students. The other thing I didn't know about, oh, yeah? I, I think that's an excellent, an excellent response is that there's a little bit of a recession issue going on here with kids can't, people can't get jobs, they realize they get a step ahead, let's go get my masters, right? And we'll go back to graduate school and do that. And the other reason that I understand is um, there is now a fifth year of accounting required. Right, of undergraduate, yeah. So um, as you, you know, see, as you learn about the accounting business today, you'll find that that you actually do need to think about considering extending your college education, your undergraduate experience in accounting in order to get into accounting as a field and get your certificate, your CPA. A lot of people, you know, make no mistake about it, a lot of people work in accounting who don't have their CPAs, okay? That's, that's one thing you should clearly understand from today is accounting is not a profession that requires your CPA. A CPA is a good way to get ahead and you won't be able to get a job at a final four firm unless you have all the requirements of a, the, under, the educational requirements of a CPA um, completed by the time you apply for a job at a final four firm. But there are a lot of firms who want to be a, who claim to be the fifth firm in America, right? <laughs> so so uh, you, you know, and and my guess is that most of them will work with you while you pursue. Um, completing those educational requirements after hours. All right. Anybody else got a question or observation about this graph? Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't forget. I lost. <laughs> Staff is always finding stuff. Mitchell, your water bottles and John Cotton Dana. One thing we do have upstairs, um, and I'll, I'll get you up there, Professor. <laughs> All right. We have, um, we've got phone rooms and conference rooms, okay? And phone rooms are, you know, little rooms you can go into where you can have a, you know, confidential conversation with somebody. And they're all named for someone who is born in Newark or who, you know, had, had, had a material part of their upbringing in Newark. The phone room that is right next to me is the Ed Koch phone room, <laughs> okay? Who knows who Ed Koch was? Nobody? I know you do. Who is Ed Koch? His honor. Right. Well, he was the mayor. Ed Koch was the mayor kind of during the uh, early 80s. Because New York was, I mean, New York was a pretty rugged place in the late 70s. There was a lot of Wild West in New York uh, in the late 70s. What your parents tell you is absolutely true. I did mean to say that on my resume. I am the, I am the father of three kids born between 84 and 88, which is another thing that qualifies me to teach to this, you know, to talk to this class, although many of you are on the younger side of that. Um, <laughs> many of you, not all of you, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and his honor, as he was known, Ed Koch, uh, also a congressman from New York, he was there. Um, Shaquille O'Neal has a uh, phone room upstairs, um, Mr. T has a uh, phone room upstairs. Whitney Houston, yes, has a phone room upstairs. So, uh, you know, we do honor um, many folks upstairs with um, different rooms. All right, so now we're going to try to move. Uh, here's the man. Ah, here's the part that's really important, right? There are 33,000 accounting graduates were hired in 2011, according to the AICPA study that was released uh, just about a month ago. That's up from 25,000 in 2009. So that's good news, right? Accounting is a area, is a profession that continues to see expanded growth. Mr. Gammons in Madison, Connecticut in 1970 suggested to me that I should get in the accounting business because it would be an expanding firm. I didn't remember what he said until 1979 but it was certainly, see, certainly something I thought of when I got that because there's a continued need to track money, 
all right, um, and track investment and, you know, for a whole variety of sociological reasons. So you're going to continue to see demand for accounting graduates going forward. Um, the total, the, the business, yes, is, has been very white. Yes, question. No, no. Most, in fact, in, in fact, technically, it's almost impossible to graduate from any program with a CPA. Right? Why is that? Anyone know? Right, you need one, two years of work experience. You can, you can have passed the exam, although that is, even that's not, I don't know, is this typical? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. There you go. Okay. Um, Seventy-one percent of firms see hiring increasing uh, over the next couple of years, and you know, thirty to fifty percent of BAs are being hired, of accounting BAs are being hired, and um, sixty to eighty percent of MSs that's being hired into the accounting world. Okay, right? So that, that doesn't mean that, that half of the Rutgers graduates who major in accounting won't get jobs. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you may find work in a different line, you know, a different profession. Okay? So, uh, all right. Let's talk about public accounting. This was, I have to be careful not to go too far here because there's only, I think there's one public accounting slide. Ah, there is. Okay. Why do we have public accounting firms? This is the interactive portion of the um, presentation, and we're doing really well time-wise. I think we're going to be done in about half an hour, so stay with me. All right? Uh, why do we have public accounting firms? <laughs> Good question, right? Why do we have public accounting firms? What do public accounting firms do? Does anyone know? No one knows. Auditing taxes. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. So this is good. Okay, you don't know this, right? So we can you know it helps me helps helps me set context for the next ten ten minutes or so. Um, accounting firms I got it. Uh, Companies are public, right? What's a public company mean? Companies are public. What? Actively traded, okay. Um, a company's public because it needs investment capital from the general public, right? That's why a company becomes a public company. They need investment capital from the general public. By the way, I did not, I, I don't even know if I knew this very well as a graduate student, okay? So um, to understand this as an undergraduate, I think is, it, it helps, right? Because it would have helped me, for sure. Uh, so if you need investment capital, and a partner at a firm taught me this about six or seven years ago, you know, if you need investment capital, you have to play by the rules of the investment community. And that's what the Securities and Exchange Commission helps set up, right? The SEC sets up the rules by which companies can get money from the general public, right? Now, one of the most important things that the SEC demands that the general public have when they are going to invest in your company is what? Financial statements, okay? Information. Right? The SEC sets up rules by which you must disclose information about your company. Right? They set up a lot of rules besides just financial statements. What are some of the other rules the SEC sets up? Any ideas? Other rules. Compensation. Right? You must disclose in a proxy statement to your shareholders the top five most highly paid people in your company as well as the compensation plans for your senior executives. Right? What other kinds of information do they have to set up? How you count things? Right? If anyone's looked at the um, public filings for Groupon 
or uh, Yelp, any of the you know recent recent um, IPOs, they see that there's all kinds of information about internet visitors, right? How many people visit their site? How you count things has to be fully and fairly disclosed, all right? That's what the SEC sets up those rules for a company to do. So what the heck you need a public accounting firm for? SEC sets up the rules. Companies present the information. Public accounting firm, why? Need a third party to verify the information. That's why we got public accounting firms. All right, public accounting firms are the public expression of they're they're you know the defense attorney for the public. Okay, to say that yeah these numbers are being counted correctly. This information is being presented fairly. All right. Now, are, is there truly an arm's length relationship with public accounting firms? No. Why? Why? Why is there no arm's length, true arm's length relationship? Because, because we pay. Firms pay public accounting firms to give them an opinion. All right? And so it can't be... Uh, it's, it's an interesting dance to how much you pay your public accounting firm, all right? But it's also one of the things that you'll find out about the industry is that there's a lot of pressure on the industry from other firms because other firms review one another to make sure that things are being done fairly and above the board. So that's, that's the real reason why we have public accounting firms. Um, uh, what are different groups in public accounting firms? There's audit. There's tax, okay? Any other groups people are aware of? Yeah? Valuation, M&A, right? Those groups, those computer, oh, sorry, excuse me? Advisory, right. Advisory for running a business, benefits, um, accounting things, uh, uh, MIS, all those kinds of things the accounting firms are getting into, right? In fact, one of the things that you'll see shortly is that there has been an expansion in the number of non-accounting hires at accounting firms, all right? Um, what do people get paid? Uh, how are careers structured in accounting firms? You probably wouldn't know this. So I'm going to just kind of march through it. There's a progression in accounting firms that, that tends to be very similar between the firms. There's an entry-level staff accountant role that most people are in from, from two to three years where you work on the audits of different, the work on the audits or tax returns or um, advisory functions of a number of different clients. If you're the bigger the firm you are, the fewer the clients you tend to have. All right. One of the it's one of the bad things about a big firm. It's also one of the good things about a big firm. Okay. Uh, you after two to three years, they tend to have senior accountants, right, who supervise the staff accountants. So one of the other great things about public accounting is you do get supervisory experience relatively early in your career. In a private accounting world, you may not supervise more than one or two individuals until you've been in to a firm for anywhere from five to ten years, right? In public accounting, you will be supervising anywhere from three to five people within three years. So it's a great way to get some great supervisory experience. Managers um, will be made in public accounting firms between six and seven years, and then ultimately partners, and partners are the guys that own the public accounting firms. All these, most public accounting firms, not all, most are partnerships as opposed to corporations, okay, that are commonly owned by the people who are in charge. Like law firms are generally partnerships, not corporations. There are reasons why you might be a corporation instead of a partnership that it's the subject of another class. <clears throat> but but um, that's business law, by the way. Um, and and so you, you'll see that there'll be... Um, uh, and partners will last in a job for a long time, okay? Although I did talk to a couple of partners in the last, I talked to one partner yesterday, who was my partner two jobs ago, who's actually retiring in June, and I said, Carbone, you are younger than I am. What are you doing retiring? I have no chance of retiring. He said, one, I can. Because <laughs> being a partner is lucrative, all right? And uh, two, one of the things that's good about um, that kind of a system they, there's a, you, can, you can retire, this is the same in many um, public entities like municipalities or state governments, is a combination of age and years of service 
generally gets you into a retirement plan of some sort, okay? And so he had achieved that combination of age and years of service where he had um, let himself, you know, got his, got his, got his opportunity to retire. So um, that's great. Uh, how many firms are there? As we talked about, there's four final firms, okay, which are actually a combination of what used to be eight firms back in the day, okay? Um, Price Waterhouse merged with Coopers and Librand, okay, and that's how there became four. Um, Ernst and uh, Arthur Young mer merged with Ernst and Winnie, and became Ernst and Young, and Arthur Anderson. <laughs> what happened to Arthur Anderson? Enron. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, Enron. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about actually in that graph of why there was an increase in accounting in, during both those periods was because of fraud, and it was actually kind of the backlash of fraud. There was a bunch of fraud cases in the um, 70s that you know started to escalate the need for more accountants. I just saw the other day that Crazy Eddie is having the last uh, payment of his case made in jail. And Crazy Eddie, you know, went bankrupt in the in the very early 80s because of a fraud problem that he had developed. And Enron, of course, was one of the big companies that went um, defunct in the, in the early 2000s, okay? And Arthur Anderson was the auditor of that firm. Arthur Anderson, I, in fact, the, the, when I took the job at the company that had the um, CFO who went to jail, they were, they were an Arthur Anderson client. Uh, it was known as L90. It was an internet advertising firm. And they were... They were clear, we, we actually had to do a restatement of the um, financial statements for that firm. After they'd done a one restatement, I came in, looked at the books. I was there three weeks, and it was clear the books were wrong. And so we started on a, pro, on, on a nine month sojourn to restate the books. We made 350 journal entries, which doesn't sound like a lot, but believe me, that's, that's, it's unbelievable in terms of the numbers that we did to restate the financial statements of the Arthur Anderson drive-by audit that they used to do. They used to be the most profitable accounting firm in the world, and uh, it was easy to understand because they just, they'd go golf. Um, that's probably not fair to many of the great Arthur Anderson partners and employees who worked very hard to do the jobs right, but clearly some partners were asleep at the switch, uh, including the one that was on our particular job. Um, how do you make partner? Oh, are the hours that horrific? I'll come back to that. How do you make partners? You're, you're there for a long time and you have a good interest in the business. The accounting business is very much a profession, right? You can, um, if, you, if you like accounting, right, as a, as a technical field of study, it can be very exciting to, uh, you know, work your entire career at an accounting firm. If you like servicing customers, Right? That's your, if you're a partner in a firm, you're very much into the world of servicing customers, right? Of providing them a service that they need, all right? So it's, <clears throat> it's a really, it can be a very interesting and financially re rewarding career. It is not easy, right? Make no mistake about it. Uh, about 10% of the people, 8 to 10% of the people that start at an accounting firm will make partner. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not that easy to become a partner. There's an enormous amount of competition. Uh, and one of the reasons is because it's, you know, rewarding and lucrative, all right? Uh, the, yes, the votes for the Academy Awards are actually counted by staff accounts, right? Entry-level accounts, although they figure out a way to do it pretty easy. We actually, we, I remember a day when it, one Saturday morning in 1982, I was down in the bowels of, a, of the... Uh, Depository Trust Company, DTC, counting stock certificates, right? Because they say they have this much stock in their vault, and they're all in, back in the day, they were all in little certificates, and you used to go in there and count them physically, right? Check them off on a little worksheet. That was it. Are the hours that horrific? If you want to work and you want to work hard, get a job at a public accounting firm. You will work as much as you want to. There is no shortage of work to go around at a public accounting firm. All right? Um, to, a, to a man and woman that I talked to in the past 72 hours, uh, getting ready for this, 
everybody thinks that y'all have different work habits than we had back in the 80s, right? Gen Y, which is what most of you folks are in loosely, Gen Y going from uh, born in 1980 to born in 95, generally. Uh, Gen Y doesn't want to work as hard as the baby boomers wanted to. Don't ask me why. They have a better work-life balance than baby boomers do. Um, so that's another reason why there's plenty of work to go around, because in accounting firms these days, they are challenged to get people to work 80-hour weeks. Right, which is kind of hard when you think about it. Eighty-hour weeks—that's that is not. It wasn't uncommon to work. Uh, it certainly wasn't uncommon to work from seventy to eighty hours a week. You, I got. I generally got one day off in the two-month period from January first to February twenty-eighth, um, and that was usually Super Bowl Sunday. Okay, I watched many an NFC and AFC championship game from the bar after work um, when I was going through those years. Saw the catch. Saw Dwight Clark's catch in a bar. Um, so, you know, you can work really hard in public accounting. No question about it. It's not as bad as what you've heard. Because firms know that in order to keep people, they've got to do a better job of matching that life-work balance. Okay? Any questions? Yes. What, what? Oh, people get paid? Is that what you're getting paid in your hands? All of a sudden, you want to get paid too? Um, starting salary for uh, accounting, so final four firms, about 60000 bucks plus overtime. Okay, so it's, it's certainly a nice wage, final four, okay? So you tend to need to have all your educational requirements completed by that point in time. Um, plus overtime, so but certainly you know, sixty eighty thousand dollars was kind of the range that most guys, the guys, the men and women I talked to gave me for um, starting salary for those folks. Partners, million dollars a year. Okay. Certainly very much within reach, making a million dollars a year. Uh, I guess that's the top one percent, huh? Yes. When you apply for a job, what are the important things to think about when you apply for a job with this group? Um, I, I'm probably, yeah. I think just like anything, any job you apply for, <clears throat> you've got to have a sincere interest in what you are trying to do. You need to have done some advance work in understanding what the firm does and have a really keen understanding of how you can help them, right, succeed. Um, certainly, you know, top-notch uh, academic performance is very important, but most accounting firms are interested in having people have a decent extracurricular activity performance. Right, you do other things because a lot of what you do in you know when you work 80 hours a week, you're not just sitting in front of a computer entertaining yourself, right? You're interacting a lot with people, so you have to have a pretty good balance of ability to deal with others, okay? Which is why I only worked with the firm for three years. <laughs> All right, but you really, I mean, you've got to have that skill, right, to be able to relate to people well. So it's a it's it's you know it's not an, it's not easy. There are about probably about a thousand graduates that'll be hired in Manhattan to work with the final four firms. So that's not many, you know. Really, two fifty a firm, and they believe me, they come from all over. Rutgers does Rutgers thirty years ago. Can't tell you about today. Thirty years ago, I'd say ten twenty percent. Of my class was from Rutgers, either the either the MBA program or the undergraduate program. It was one of the more popular schools for um, taking students, no doubt because of the fine education that you receive from the professors here. Uh, 
Okay? Any other questions about public accounting? All right. I'm starting to run out of fuel here. We've got to make sure we get the plane to the runway before the uh, plane expires. Um, so here's Simple Corp Inc., right? And, this, you know, most businesses, I, I, I've, I've tried to generalize things as, and boil things down as far as I could, right, from a business standpoint. Most businesses are set up with three principal groups that do things, okay? Key to every business is building a product, right? That's the most important thing in any business, whether you're making pizzas, right, or you're making audit opinions. The most important thing you have is a product, right? And the product generally involves some sort of engineering, right? How you cut a pepperoni, how you build a website, right? It's all... The same thing, without a product, you don't have a business. Um, there's old school products and there's new school products. So there's movies, there's music, there's, you know, there's all kinds of things you can make for product. You can think of everything. You can think of a hospital as a product, right? But to me, I always try to boil things down into products. And generally, there's some sort of engineer involved with the product. There's a lot of jobs that involve being able to help engineers communicate. Because if there's any group of people that can't communicate, it's engineers. And I would say that with my CTO, any of my CTOs, throughout my career, right next to me, tell you that. All right? And that's where they have jobs for product managers, right, to communicate. All right. Once you get your product, what do you got to do? Sell it. Okay? You got to sell it. Right? And so there's always a group for sales and marketing. Right. This can range from, I mean, in my career, I've been very involved with selling cable television, right? I've been in a lot of what are known as um, B2C businesses, right, where you're selling things to a consumer, business to consumer, okay? I'm currently in a B2C job, right, selling digital audio books to consumers, all right? I've also been in a number of B2B jobs where you're selling your product to another business. Okay? This was, if you're selling advertising, you're frequently in a, you regard yourself as a B2B job, right? Where you're selling advertising to a company like Procter & Gamble. Okay? So you're at Google, you're selling, you know, you're an individual who is, salespeople make a lot of money. Make no mistake about that. Salespeople make a lot of money. Because right? they get rewarded for selling stuff. And it's really easy to reward them for selling stuff. Because it's pretty easy to track how much they've sold. So that's one of the nice things about being a sales, salesperson. Software guys. All, right? all kinds of people sell stuff. Right? In, both in B2B businesses and in B2C businesses, you've got to market things to sell them. So there's always a group of people that's involved with the creative element of marketing and also the evaluating part of marketing, right? Evaluating the investment of marketing. People with a good, strong accounting mind, right, who are good with numbers can succeed in the marketing business very easily, right? You can bridge your skill in, mar in accounting over to marketing a lot of the time. Because one of the things that you, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm deeply involved with our marketing group. Right? In many ways, more so than our technology group. Because technology, we evaluate how much it costs to make a product. Um, it's kind of a straightforward, and what the product might be involved in. Right? In marketing, I'm very involved in deciding how much money we might spend on advertising for television, for billboards, for search, for um, banner ads. Okay? And, and I evaluate them by looking at what's the return that we're going to get. How many customers are we going to get? from that advertising. What's a customer worth in a lifetime? So, and there are people on the other side of the conversation, the marketing group, who need to understand numbers. So, you know, marketing is a great thing to think about from a career standpoint for people who have a good foundation in accounting. All right? And then on the other side of the world, from these three, in Simple Code Corp, is administration. 
when I talk about administration, I see three, three principal disciplines in administration for most companies, all right? Legal, all right, you've got to have simple corp. Is it a partnership or is it a corporation? Is it private? Is it public? All right, do you have contracts? Every, you know, everything you're going to have between your, you and your employees, between you and your suppliers, between you and your uh, providers of marketing services involves a contract, right? Law is certainly, a, you know, we have two, three, four, five, six attorneys in our company. Many work in the product side, some work in the product side, some work in the marketing side, some work in the legal side, right? Human resources, another key area for administration, right? Certainly, the more service-oriented you are, the more you have to focus on that kind of work. And then uh, finance group, <coughs> who focuses on uh, all the stuff we'll talk about in the next slide. I will tell you that some CFOs help manage legal and human resources. I have helped manage legal and human resources most of my career. So I've always had an interest in law. In fact, I went to college thinking I was going to become a lawyer before I got into education. So I always had a little bit of an orientation towards making a deal, making sure the, the wording in contracts is correct. We review, I review every contract we sign, right? It, because, you know, it, it involves the financial relationship between two firms. If you're a finance guy, you really better be able to understand the words and how they end up as numbers. So it's a skill that uh, you know, you need to be cognizant. That's why you have to pass the business law part of the CPA exam, right? So, yeah, okay. Something's changed. I, know, I understand you can take it on computers now. Back in the day, you couldn't even bring a calculator in. <laughs> no, no joke. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and of course, human resources and finance uh, is a funny mix to some people, but other times it's not because, you know, uh, having low turnover rates for your employees is based on a good way you have the organization set up and that's how you, um, you know, that's, that's why you stay involved with human resources. So even if you don't necessarily oversee human resources as a finance guy, you're always going to be somebody who's involved with it. Finance teams are organized this way and I, I show you this just so you can have an understanding, oh. just so you have an understanding of lots of the different areas that accounting folks get into. Right when they work within Simple Corp, uh, accounting clearly is you know is probably the first and most important group for any CFO. These are people who manage transactions, so everything from paying invoices to collecting money, right, and just about everything you can imagine in between. Um, making sure you have a good so, so make sure you have good operational processes to do both things. Making sure you have a good way of tracking that information, so that you know so you can tell managers who are your customers, what you've been doing is important. Worrying about the fraud and the cost of collection on the collection side, okay? Then you know there's clearly the accounting principal issues that are involved for how you record revenue in your business. Right? When you record cost, what cost do you record? Uh, you know, there's, even, in, even in our relatively simple business, there are a number of more complicated accounting topics that you can always get a couple different answers on. So that's what the accounting group does. There's, in, in, most, in most companies, you want to have some sense of what the financial plan's going to be. Why are you worried about a financial plan? Why would a, why would a business worry about a, first, a financial plan? Yes, to attract investors. Sure, that's one good reason, right, to attract investors. Uh, yes, see where the business is headed. Yeah, yeah, that's important in terms of attracting investors, right, to know what might happen. Prepare a budget. Why would you prepare a budget? Yeah, the, God's honest truth, right? This is Christmas 2000, right? We got $50,000 in the bank and payroll is $400,000, <laughs> okay? 
That's why you plan. To make sure you can make payroll. <laughs> That's the first reason you plan, is to make sure that you don't have to tell your employees on payday that there's no money for it. <laughs> Just kidding about that work for the past two weeks. <laughs> don't laugh too hard. That happens in more companies than you think. And the reason it happens is because someone didn't plan. Right? At least they should be able to tell you two weeks in advance. We're not going to be able to pay in two weeks. Sorry. Right? <laughs> we did make that. By the way, we did make that payroll. We, we made the payroll. I've never missed a payroll. But I've worked with a lot of companies. I mean, one of the things, one of the, one of the challenging things about working in companies that need help and need, you know, turn around is that you get exposed to situations where you do not have enough money in the bank. And um, that's one of the reasons that they're in those situations. Uh, is they didn't have a good plan, okay? Guys that manage, folks that manage money in a treasury group, companies tend to be larger that have treasury groups, but these guys work with um, not only cash management for the cash that comes in from credit card companies for online types of companies or for big customers and collection activities, but also You've got debt holders, bond holders, you've got dividends to worry about in bigger corporations. All that's done with the treasury group. Those people will have accounting in their background. They'll also have some finance, okay, because it'll involve how you structure debt. All right, a big, you know, a big area. You'll see a lot more MBAs in the treasury area than in the accounting area. Internal audit is an area where many accounting uh, degree professionals get some experience looking at their own company. A lot of internal audit is worried about operational issues as well as uh, accounting and intellectual issues. And then M&A. Most companies have, are involved in some sort of corporate development or M&A group. People with an accounting background can clearly get into this area. All right? Why do I share all this with you? Because I don't want you to think that by having an accounting degree, you're doomed to work in the accounting group for a finance area. Okay? Every single one of the boxes I showed you, both on this slide and the last slide, people with accounting degrees are in. All right? So you're, you, know, you, you're, you should pursue having a solid background in accounting because it gives you a clear financial footing going forward that enables you to step very comfortably into any of these other boxes. That's one of the things that, you know, one of the messages you should be left with today is that accounting as a background is very valuable to you. Okay, that's the exciting part. Everybody still with me? Oh yeah. Uh, okay, I call this wisdom. I usually call this wisdom when I'm talking with my kids' friends after 10 o'clock at night around the beer pong table. Uh, <laughs> That's where much of this wisdom came from. Um, but I, I, that's why I call it that, because that's once you get over, when your hair gets really blonde like mine. Um, <laughs> no, this is wisdom. It's all wisdom there. Right? That's all you get. When you get all your hair gets blonde and you get wisdom. Uh, so I've put them all in one list, and we'll talk about each one. Um, but let's take a look at. Take a preview. That's some of my Mountain Dew. God, I love Mountain Dew. Diet Mountain Dew. Anybody had this? It's good stuff. Zero calories. How can they make how can they make Mountain Dew with zero calories? It seems like it's impossible. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and, and, and there's some sales and marketing going on here too. Right. Yeah. How do we sell How do we sell this to blonde guys with wisdom? <laughs> You put diet on it. If you don't like sales, how many people here don't like sales? Uh, medical professions calling. <laughs> One thing about accounting, right, is you are going to be a salesperson, right? People always ask, "How do you get into accounting?" I say, "I love sales. I love sales. Right? I am always selling the company." Right? I'm selling the way we have an idea. Okay? So if you don't, if you're not comfortable with sales, right, I use this as a suggestion to both start thinking about, all right, where, where, help me take a class that gets me comfortable with sales. Right? With selling ideas. 
and how I can convince somebody to take my ideas. And it's not just, you know, sometimes you, you're going to find these classes in funny places. Dale Carnegie is a great program, for instance, on teaching you how to sell, right? Teaching you how to express yourself uh, in a way that makes people understand what you're saying and accept it. So if you don't like sales, um, medicine's calling, right? Or find another, or find some part of your training going forward that gets you more comfortable with sales, right? Because you're going to be selling stuff. And I, I think this is in most things in life. And of course, everyone sits back and goes, yeah, you're right. I probably am selling myself somehow, right? You know, whether it's to your friends or to your parents or, you know, to your landlord um, or a potential job applicant, you know, job applicant, you're going to be selling something, get good at it. All right, so because you're going to have to do it. <clears throat> Find something complicated that you enjoy and get really good at it. Uh, how many people here have read the outliers or listened to it? Okay, one person. Huh? All right, two. The Outliers is a great book. All right. In fact, if you go to Audible.com, <laughs> you can you can take a free trial. You should be able to find a way at audible.com to get a free trial. Download Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Outliers. And it talks about um, the power of hard work. Right? He talks about in The Outliers, he, he, he does one of his theories is that if you look at it, and this is true, if you look at it, most professional hockey players are born in the first three months of the year. All right? And why is that? Because all junior programs in Canada start have a cutoff at January 1st. It's why most baseball players that we all may have grown up with were born after July 1st, okay? Because little league programs have that as the cutoff, right? And you always get scaled up that way. So, but he also talks about in another chapter of the book how if you look at people mastering a skill, they put 10,000 hours of effort into mastering a skill, all right? You know what skill I mastered? Spreadsheets. You know what I started? 1981. Okay? That's the first time I ran into a spreadsheet. Senior Jeff Resnick told me, gave me a book on VisiCalc, which was the software product before um, Lotus 123. I said, here, you're taking the train home to Connecticut every night. You ought to read this. I think it's going to be useful. So I not only got really good at accounting, because I had a liberal arts background, I got good at accounting and I got good at spreadsheets. I also got good at fixed asset accounting. Right? I became very technically adept at certain skills and began enjoyed using them. The other thing I suggest to folks is find an industry that you enjoy studying. I love the media business. Okay? One thing you're going to do in, wor in, in the real world is you're going to have to study your industry outside of work. You're going to have to be, you're going to have to enjoy studying your industry outside of work because that's how you're going to get, you know, that's how you're going to get ahead. That's how you're going to start to have fun with it. That's how you're going to come up with new ideas that are going to inspire the people in sales, marketing, and product if you stay on the finance side of the things. So those are the, you know, the two principal pieces of wisdom, right, are find something complicated that you can get good at, right? It may be, it may be fair market value um, determination or accounting, right? It may be the develop, it may be SQL. Right? But if you find something that's technically good and complicated and you get good at it, and you find an industry that you enjoy doing, then the fourth piece of wisdom can apply. The fourth piece of wisdom is you have, if you have fun at what you do, you have worked the last day of your life. Okay? I didn't invent that quote. That quote's out there. Right? But if you have fun at what you do, it's not work. We closed the books yesterday. Right? I can't tell you how much fun I have closing the books every month. Right? I love closing the books because I love planning. I plan for what the numbers are going to be, and then we close them. And then I've got to figure out why there's a difference. Okay? But it's fun. I like doing it. Right? And that's why it's not really work. Um, and neither is this. Okay? So um, that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, questions? Yes. Um, 
I just, you know, <laughs> I, I should lie. Uh, the one thing about being an accountant is you have to be very comfortable with the truth. <laughs> because you will not get far uh, in this world. I mean, it's one of, the things, one of the reasons why I got eight CEOs who I've worked for who all stand up and say, one thing about Mitchell, he tells you the truth. <laughs> um, my grades were not great. I had a really, I, had a, I, had, I, I went to a very challenging boarding school to get into college. So I kind of took four years off in college and, um, you know, had a very good time. And, <laughs> and Dartmouth in the late 70s, you know, was one of those places. Animal House came out senior year. Um, uh, yeah, and written by a Dartmouth guy. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I had to recover. Okay? But, you know, I, I, so I got myself to the point where I couldn't get a job after I graduated from college. And, uh, but I fortunately found a firm, Price Waterhouse, that thought enough of me that they would, they said to me, listen, if you go to Northeastern's business school, we've got an internship spot for you. Right? So you go, you, you, you look like you did, I did, I did very well in my accounting course, got an A in my accounting course at Dartmouth. And they say, you clearly seem to have an aptitude for this stuff because you didn't get A's in anything else. <laughs> right? And if you go pursue this in a little more, in a little more detail, uh, we, you know, we like what we see here. We think we got a spot for you and come work on it. So there's, there's always hope even if you don't have good grades. Okay? Um, I do like pursuing things intellectually. Right? I do get some enjoyment out of that. So even though I might not have had great grades, I still have an intellectual thirst, which I think is almost as important as having good grades. Right? Yes? Forensic accounting. So when, I, when we took over that company, I was at Max Worldwide back there in the early 2000s, 2002, 2003. That's what we were doing was forensic accounting. We were going through literally every transaction and determining whether it was fraudulently created or not, okay? Because in that particular um, company, we had a lot of round trips, which were not airplane tickets to Paris and back, <clears throat> but were transactions where a company was buying advertising on our network and we were turning around and buying advertising on their network. So we were boosting the revenues of both companies. And these people were literally, you could find the emails. I mean, we were connecting, we were connecting the dates on invoices with email conversations that they were having, saying, I'll meet you at Santa Monica Pier at 1 to exchange the money. I mean, you know, it was, but, but, you know, there's a lot to it. So there's a lot of, you know, forensic accounting is something that came out of the Enron case more than anything else and the, and the fall of Arthur Anderson. Um, it's a great profession to, uh, to pursue, a great part of the accounting profession to pursue. Requires a great eye for detail, and it also requires a skill to sell. Because you've got to sell to people the fact that, hey, I'm relating this email conversation with that invoice, and look what this is telling us. Right? This is telling us there was fraud. So, okay, something else. Question? I do. Uh, Why, Bill? Why, you got to spend money to make money. Okay, I, I had a uh, CEO from my regional cable company here in New Jersey explain that to me back in the late 80s. Okay, that you got to spend money to make money. So, you, you know, you got to keep your feet on the ground in making investment decisions. But, and, and, and I do tend to be the one that keeps decisions closer to the midpoint than many of my colleagues, um, which is why you're an important anchor on a team. You just don't want to be, you know, an anchor on the plane, right? So it's, it's important. Yeah. I, I think the most sad, sad I, I love closing the book. <laughs> I really love, you know, scorekeeping. One thing that I found in every single company I was with, and I think you'll probably see this in other areas of your personal life, is um, is 
if you're not keeping score, you're probably having a problem, right? If you don't, you know, and if you, if you want to avoid problems, start keeping score. I don't care if it's stepping on the scale, right, every morning. I don't care if it's counting reps in the gym. I don't care if it's keeping track of the number of books you read. You know, if you start keeping score, you're going to do better at what you do because there's a human nature that wants to improve, right? So finding improvement is, is very important. And each one of my stops, I've had a lot of satisfaction in closing the books and getting a good seal of approval from companies that we closed the books and we had procedures that were appropriate and um, that worked out. I'm very frustrated at um, when change doesn't happen fast enough. When you know where you want to get and everybody else doesn't understand it as clearly as you do, right? So I get very frustrated. So what does that mean I have to do? I got to sell. I got to sell people on that idea because that's how I get frustrated is I have not been able to convince people that where we want to go is over here. So once again, you know, selling leads to getting rid of the frustration. Great question. Thank you. Question? Don should be or not me for that question, um, but they might not have made payroll. I will tell you that. Um, I know there was a time. I, I will say we made payroll that day in 2000 for a different company I was at, but I didn't get myself paid. I only had enough people. I only had enough to pay everybody else but me and the CEO. Um, that was an important investment for Audible because it got us good. Um, it got us some money when we needed it. Uh, and most companies go through that process where they don't have enough money to invest. You know, to spend money to make money, you got to have more money to invest and keep the keep the plane up, keep the plane up in the air. The sooner later, people are going to start downloading books. I mean, for Audible, Audible created in '98. You know, it struggled until Steve Jobs brought out the iPod. I mean, there were you know, MP3 players were. Few and far between before 1984. I mean, before 2004. I know that none of you believe that that's possible. But there was, you know, before 2004, we were listening to CDs, <laughs> and they were, you know, I'm, how many of you have ever spun an LP on a, on a turntable? Who spun an LP on a turntable? Two people, three, four, five. Five people have spun an LP on a turntable. Hey. Yeah, you know, I was talking about how fast technology changes, right? I mean, probably some of you have never put a CD into a player. <laughs> how many of you have paid for music? Okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that. Any other questions? Because now I'm, now I'm, I'm going to break my word. It hasn't been as big an issue for us because our content is much longer. And one of the beauties of um, encrypted content that we have is its, um, its memory state. So, so when you stop listening to a book that's, that's in audible format, it will remember where you are. Whereas with unencrypted content, it goes back to the beginning. And you have to find you know, the front. Yeah, without without the hassle of going into a tunnel, right? Oh yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. It, correct, correct. No, no. This is it's all true. Of course, the difference with audio books is they're ten hours long, so you're copying ten CDs. Okay. So it's just a bigger hassle. So because of the hassle factor, we have not seen a big problem with, pi with piracy, okay, compared to music. Yep. Well, intangible assets that we have as a company, okay, so when Amazon acquired 
audible. It paid through his public record. Right? I'm not telling you anything out of school here. Um, is uh, audible? They, they acquired Audible for three hundred million dollars in cash. They acquired all the stock outstanding on Audible. We had hundred million dollars of cash in the bank at the time, and then we had twenty million of fixed assets and hard assets. Okay, so they had a hundred and eighty million dollar hole they had to fill with. Defining tangible assets and defining intangible assets. This is one of the things we were going to, I was going to come and talk about. And I think you've had a better time in the last, you know, 100 minutes than I would have had doing it this way. <laughs> but, but, you know, we filled that hole with a number of loosely tangible assets like customer value, the value of the content relationships that we had, and then you were left with the intangible value of goodwill. Okay, that we've more than paid off for the Amazon shareholders, right? We've been a very successful acquisition. Are we close to the last question here, Professor? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, question. Most important skills? Being able to talk on your feet? Uh, I, you know, one skill that I don't think you can underestimate is you have to have the proper balance of serious, Okay, like we talked about with school, right, and sense of humor, right? I think those are two good, important skills for you to think about as you walk forward. It's having, you know, that good sense of being serious and intellectual and still having a good sense of humor, okay? Thank you all for your time today. Good luck, all right?